Well, hello everyone. My name is Janelle Simmons. I am the manager of programs here at Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society, and I'm excited to be moderating today's Google Hangout on how to engage more African Americans in STEM. Our panelists this afternoon are Sigma Xi member Dr. Shanti Johnson. She's the Assistant Vice Provost for Faculty Recruitment and Associate Professor and Executive Director of the Institute for Broadening Participation at the University of Texas at Arlington. She is one of the first female African-American chemical oceanographers in the country and the first African-American to earn a doctoral degree in oceanography from Texas A&M University. And I believe, if memory serves me correctly, she is still the only one at Texas A&M as an African-American to earn the doctoral degree in oceanography. Next, we have Dr. Melanie Okoro a water quality specialist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and she serves as its National Marine Fisheries Service West Region Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator. And our final panelist is Dr. Danielle Lee, postdoctoral research associate at Cornell University and she is also a TED Fellow. So before we begin to hear from our panelists, I wanted to share a few staggering statistics. So according to a 2011 report by the National Academy of Sciences, underrepresented minority students that aspire to STEM majors historically have lower completion rates than their non-minority counterparts. Now, what's interesting about this is that they express the same level as their counterparts, but they're just not um, finishing up. At, at the same rate. And in addition, according to a 2015 National Science Foundation report, advanced degrees earned between 1993 and 2012 by underrepresented minorities were low, from 6 to 14 percent for master's degrees and 4 to 6 percent for PhDs. So, you know, t with that in mind, the goal for today's Google Hangout is to share experiences and also to discuss solutions as to how we can engage more African Americans in STEM. Now, during this broadcast, we will be tweeting live. So, Sigma Xi will be tweeting live throughout the broadcast. In addition, you have an opportunity to ask questions as well. You should be able to see on the left side, the right side of your screen, an opportunity to post your questions. If you do not have that on your screen, you can also just directly post questions to the event page and we will try to respond to as many of them within the hour time frame. So, without further ado, I want to thank our panelists for joining us this afternoon. And what I would like for them to do is introduce themselves and, you know, share with us how they became involved in, in STEM. So, if we can, um, Dr. Johnson? <laughs> Um, I feel like the elder on the on the, <laughs> the broadcast. So I became in, interested in STEM when I was in third grade. I was in talented and gifted programs. Um, grew up in a nice neighborhood, inner city, um, Dallas. A very family oriented because everybody lived around, and we were just taught that we could do what we wanted to. So I had a teacher, uh, Miss Kazee who said, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I know that's not the question that we really should ask, but what problems should you solve? But at this point, I wanted to be a marine scientist because I wanted to be like Jacques Cousteau. I watched him on TV every weekend. Um, that was before VHSs and everything else and recording. It was like you had to actually be there or you missed it. Um, and I watched him. He had a blast going all over the world, working with different people, different cultures, showing me all these wonderful um, exhibits coming out from the ocean. I said, I wanted to do that when I grew up. And so that's what I decided to do in third grade. And I had teachers after Ms. Kazee. There was Martha Jane Lee from fourth through sixth grade, another talented, strong African-American woman who said, you can do it. So between my teachers and my family, it was put inside me that yes, I could do it. It was up to me, not only to be successful for myself, but for my community. Fantastic. If you can, I'm Dr. Okoro, if you can share your experiences getting started in STEM. Well, you know what? I, um, I grew up in Alabama, so I'm a country girl. I grew up in Tuskegee, and um, me and my twin sister and my great grandmother, we go fishing every Saturday morning at Lake Martin and I can't tell you that I actually enjoyed it uh, but we were outside a lot 
we were outside in nature a lot. Um, and then <clears throat> taking those experiences and transitioning into um, undergrad, doing quite a bit of work in uh, urban stream ecology, uh, not really finding my, my love of the science, uh, but I fell in love with the curiosity. So the things that I could not see in the environment is what I love to study. And so um, I went on to uh, UNBC, University of Baltimore County, uh, in Baltimore to study nitrogen cycling. So uh, again, another process I couldn't see, but I, I, I loved uh, thinking about the magic of it all. And uh, through those experiences, had really great uh, mentors along the way, both women and men um, from different backgrounds and ethnicities, uh, that helped me along the way to continue to, to pursue uh, my love of the unknown, um, but also helped me to uh, stay grounded uh, in, in, in my culture, but knowing that I had a support. And again, uh, Dr. Ashanti Johnson is uh, one of the big, big reasons why I sit here today. Fantastic. And yes, Dr. Leaf, you can share your experiences in, in becoming interested in STEM. Thanks. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and my mom was a summer parks and recreation worker, and I got to go to work with her every day. And I spent every day outside getting dirty, and she often sent me on these nature scavenger hunts, which resulted in me being the park champion four-leaf clover hunter repeatedly, no matter where I went. <laughs> And it was those types of activities that really cultivated my eye for curiosity and observing. And I was always interested in animals. I was always bringing something home. I was always asking questions and wanting to interact. And that's really what started it for me. And then as I progressed in school, I actually struggled in my formal science classes but I had a really good keen comprehension of animals and ecology overall. And the trick was persevering through not the best grades and still demonstrating my enthusiasm and overall comprehension of the concepts and the processes and just pushing through. That's really what did it for me. Fantastic. Now, um, Dr. Okoro, you mentioned um, Dr. Johnson and how she has been very instrumental. So if you can, you know, I want to hear your point of view of how that relationship started and actually talk about the relationship that um, we're talking about, which actually part of it became part of an article that was in the latest edition of American Scientists. And I will be asking both of you to talk about that article. But if anyone is interested in American Scientists, this is the latest edition, which can be found at americanscientist.org and also at your local newsstands as well. And it, it talks about this relationship that Dr. Johnson and Dr. Okora had. and, and helps to talk about ways to engage uh, minorities in, in STEM fields. So if you can, Dr. Okoro, and then Dr. Johnson, I would like to ask you about your experience in, in connecting with Dr. Okoro and in your relationship. Well, you know, it started back in 2009 when I was a doctoral student at uh, UNVC. And during that time, I spent a lot of, uh, I spent a lot of hours out in the field. Uh, in wetlands and urban streams, and a lot of that work is is in ecology is is done in isolation. And you may have a, a TA that comes along with you, or um, but a, a lot of that work is very much so isolated. And <clears throat> I remember having a conversation with a fellow student. I think I believe she was a Meyerhoff uh, student, and and I was telling her about how I was just feeling so isolated, and when I even though I loved ecology and I loved being out in the field, I just never really saw uh, any other individuals um, from the same background. And she said, you know what, Melanie, you should, you should apply for the uh, minorities striving to pursue higher degrees in earth sciences program. And at that time, I hadn't heard of the program before, and she told me a little bit about it. It was specifically 
designed for um, some of the issues that I had talked with her about. It was a, a program that was designed to, to, to cultivate um, dialogue, uh, have a sense of community within, within the Earth System Sciences field, and um, it was a great program, but it was also a very rigorous program, it's a two-year program. And so I applied to the program, um, and this program was, it's, was founded by Dr. Shanti Johnson. And, it, and actually, she may not know this, but I didn't get in the first time I applied to the program because of how rigorous the program was. And so a, a year later, I applied again, and um, I was accepted into the program. And, you know... It, there, this program opened up a very different world for me. One where I saw uh, other minorities who were in the Earth System Sciences, and they were excelling and doing great. Um, and you know, I I had a very different perspective on you know what this community could be uh, for me. And so I'll stop there, and um, I, you know, I'll turn it over back back over to you, Janelle. Okay, great. So, Dr. Johnson, so you see, you know, at this point, you know, she's a, you know, grad student. Your experiences, you know, meeting her and working with her and getting her to where she is today. Um, so one of the things is the MSPhD program that um, Melanie talked about was actually birthed out of an experience of isolation that I had as an oceanography major at a research institution where I was the only and the lonely. Um, and it was before the whole internet, um, emailing and everything else. So there was a sense of isolation that couldn't be even overcome. Um, you were it. And so what I was committed to doing when I had an opportunity to engage with NASA as a pilot level is to help other students that are talented of color overcome that bar barrier of isolation. Um, by bringing them together at key meetings um, to see and grow a community of excellent scholars of color in the earth system science fields. Um, I kind of smile, not, I did not remember um, that Melanie didn't get in the first time. Um, it was so painful going through all those applications year after year after seeing talented people and wanting to accept everybody that we went to an approach where we have scientists from across the country review them, you know, utilizing, kind of mimicking the NSF system. And so they're reviewed on three different scientists review them, and then we do rankings. And so I approached it systematically. Um, and, you know, one of the things is when I meet people who are so talented and want them to be engaged, I'm encouraging of them, saying, if you don't get in, please do benefit from the resources. You can still be part of the community um, and just realize that there is another time. So I'm glad to know that Melanie is again, and that's a similar story that I had. You know, I'm also part of the Ford Foundation a Fellowship family where I didn't get in the first time. And so then I applied again and got in for a pre-doc and a post-doc, and now I'm going to quote their council of elders. So the idea of becoming not only having an opportunity, but a sense of community that can support you, um, to encourage you when you have some, um, some challenges, who can congratulate you when you have some successes, is so important um, so that we're not feeling as though we're isolated and alone. And so as I've watched through the MSPhD's program, seeing all these talented individuals morph from mentees to mentors and to now colleagues, it's been an amazing experience. And so I just have this huge grin on my face because I'm like, wow, look at what we're doing now in the field. Fantastic. Now, I did want to um, answer a question that we just received. Um, of course, being that this is a panel of all women, the first question we had was, are men allowed to join in on the conversation? <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely, we welcome everyone to join the conversation. So yes, men are al allowed to chime in and, and answer questions and, and provide us with, with your thoughts. So I do want to make sure I got that out there before we proceeded any further. So um, in terms of the mentoring, we talked about, you know, of course, it provides of some outreach. So I wanted to ask Dr. Lee in terms of the work that she's done with, with outreach and if you can share with us and, and the audience your outreach efforts. My outreach efforts started in graduate school and they actually crystallized when I was an NSF Foundation graduate from 
kindergarten to 12th grade education program, so the GK-12 fellowship, and it paired science graduate students with K-12 educators, and we were actually embedded in classrooms teaching lessons. And so that's when it really crystallized for me, working with students in the classroom and them having such aversion and resistance to the lessons really challenged me to think about my professionalism as far as sharing science. And that's really when I developed this philosophy that I share science. It doesn't matter if it's research related or explaining information or giving people experiences. It's about sharing it with people and really focusing on sharing it with people who have been historically marginalized from the sciences. And so I started a after school program at my assigned high school, which was Normandy High School in St. Louis, Missouri. And from there it it evolved into starting a summer research program for high school students assigned to graduate students in the biology department, which gained me access to jobs as a summer worker, doing essentially what my mother had done many, many years ago. So, But I was able to really bring this urban ecology and animal behavior thrust to our everyday outdoor programming. And that's how I started blogging, just describing and recapping these ex everyday experiences I was having with youth outside during the summers and after school. And actually, Dr. Lee, there is a question for you if you would be um, able to respond. And the question is that you were exposed to nature through your mother's work, but despite your, your social grades, were there teachers or other community members um, who encouraged you? And what were the most motivating experiences? It, it was it was encouraging in the very general sense. So like Dr. Johnson, I was surrounded by a village of people who invested in me and my peers. Like, you can do anything. But no one had actually explained to me that a career in science that was divorced from medical practice was a possibility. And that's important. Everyone kept telling me to be a doctor or a veterinarian and I didn't know that I could just do what I was doing all along which was studying animals and playing outside and so that general community of support is very very important but I also would like to see students who come behind me um, feel like they don't have to pave their own way to figure things out. So I really want them to understand that there's a variety of careers they can do outside of being a doctor or a nurse or a veterinarian if they are so inclined. <laughs> Fantastic. And while we're talking about community of support, I wanted to talk to um, Dr. Johnson. I have a question for you. And in the article that I mentioned previously in American Scientist that you co-authored with um, Dr. Coro, you write of a supportive environment that you had growing up between your parents, teachers, and school, and you write that what was critical to your success. So for parents or teachers who may be watching the Hangout and want to help their students become more involved in STEM, what advice do you have for them? Um, so I think it's important that we encourage. We encourage it the way that we're able to, um, whether that's having them go on to um, some downloadable apps to see people of color in STEM, which they have wonderful apps like that, or seeing what they're interested in, um, taking advantage of the museums that are around, having the subscriptions to magazines come to the house. Um, I know we're all about the digital world, but sometimes flipping those pages helps you think and to dream and imagine. Um, so I don't think we should ever get away from that. And just realizing that it's an it's a opportunity to explore. And so encourage that level of exploration as they're identifying what their strengths are and what their dreams are and to listen to them and to figure out how you can help to support them. Um, and that becomes then the, the parents tapping in, teachers tapping into their networks. And so it's even early on networking that happens in the communities 
that then we hope that the students then learn to to take advantage of that. And if I could real quickly, I saw Catalina Martinez is online and she's been one of our mentors for MSPCs and she's made some really good points about networking and underrepresented minorities um, and it's something that's important and sometimes we, we're not comfortable in doing that. And so even teaching the faculty members that we're working with the importance of having the students feel comfortable, whether it's helping them with elevator speeches, giving them introductions to scientists that they might want to engage with, allowing them to do the presentation for the science, you know, actually having the student do it versus the professor do it, encouraging them so that they can become a part of that community earlier on so then they can go ahead and continue down the career path. So I think the more that we engage the sense of community first as young children and then later on as students and beyond, the better we are to move it forward. And it's so funny you mentioned Catalina because she actually wanted to thank you for all that you've done and continue to do. She just um, posted something and she's very proud to have been an early participant in the program. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew that kudos was given to you by, by Catalina. Thank you. And you mentioned about the communities and, and educating and, and being involved in the local communities. So Dr. Johnson, can you talk about what steps an educator can take to finding these problems to solve in their local communities and if anyone else, any of the other panelists want to, to join in in this conversation as well, please, please do because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big question that, you know, answers are, are, are needed. So I think some of the things that are out now, we've done the scholarly work on positive factors and part of that is role modeling, part of it is hands-on opportunities, part of it is the encouragement and the, the family support, the financial um, arrangements. Um, the role modeling, role modeling is easier now than it was in the 70s, than it was in the 80s because there are not only more people there but we're able to find them via the web. So where they might not be local, then we have a student who's really committed to doing something, astronomy, oceanography, whatever it may be. If we take a little time, we can find some kind of connection. It might not be of the same ethnicity or the gender, but there's something there that we can have a student connect with. It can encourage them. And so I would really encourage students um, and educators to look for those connections and realizing that the numbers still are few, but that that's not a hindrance. That should be something that they then look at and say, we want to change that. We want to add to those numbers. And we want to encourage you to do that. So how do we make it happen? And we reach out to those who have been successful. And we're really, for the most part, really nice people. And so if you can get some time with us, I answer a lot of emails. I do webcasts with different people. I went to elementary school, anything. And that's my whole group, my whole Co my whole cohort of peers. We're committed to helping and as the younger generation comes on, and I can't believe I said younger generation, I really am feeling like an elder. Um, <laughs> also encouraging them to do um, the lit that we climb. So as we're successful, the whole community is successful. So giving back is something that is so rewarding, much more so than you can at your desk to actually make that connection, put that spark in that child's eye that says, okay, now I know I can do it because you did. And if you could do it and you're telling me that I can, all right, let's get it done. Fantastic. Now, Dr. Coro, um, where do you think your career would be without this program, the MS-PhDs program? You know what? That's a, that's a really great question. I wish you would have uh, sent me that email before. I would have thought about it a little bit more. But I can tell you that... I probably would not in this particular path and projection. So um, I do a lot of work um, uh, on conservation and protection of threatened species, but the impacts of water quality on that. And I can tell you that um, in particular for this field, uh, there are not a lot of women of color. And it, it could potentially have been an isolation uh, a point of isolation for me and one where at the time and and as a graduate student I had thought you know what I don't I don't really know if this is the career path for me because it played such a, a, a large role in my perception 
of the community, uh, the science, and the support behind it. Because I was able to go through the MS PhDs program as well as um, a couple other programs that I'd like to mention, like the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Graduate Science Program and uh, National Science Foundation REU programs that I've been uh, able to take advantage of throughout my professional career, uh, they really uh, provided the background uh, and the foundation and the support for me to continue in a field that I absolutely love and to own it, uh, not feel isolated uh, in it, uh, but also to uh, begin to, to uh, reach back and uh, support others that may have interest in the field, may not even know about the field. Um, you know, any way that I can continue to give back and reach back is, is now what I'm interested in doing as a result of being in a program like MSPhDs. Great, fantastic. So we've got a lot of questions. So I want to be able to, to get as many of these questions answered. So one question that we have, and it's for any of the panelists, um, can you talk about the importance of networking for students and that tends to not be a part of the curriculum? And how can professors encourage that without overwhelming themselves? And how can professionals make themselves more uh, accessible? So anyone can chime in on this question. I don't know how professors can do it without making students feel overwhelmed, <laughs> just to be honest. <laughs> But one of the things I think is important for everyone, students especially, to recognize is that a network is something you build before you need it. So you need to think about cultivating genuine relationships, not just with your professors, but also consider your teaching assistants, fellow students who are senior to you, as well as perhaps even those in different majors or courses. And that's because what the network really does is that it expands your reach to get information about opportunities. So like Dr. Okoro mentioned, those summer research experiences for undergraduates, they are advertised those throughout your campus. But if you're networking with colleagues by joining clubs, I do recommend college students take full advantage of the undergraduate experience. Join at least one club in your major as well as one that goes across multiple disciplines. Start there. I encourage professors to encourage students to participate in these clubs, to at least try out a research experience during the semester, even if it's not deep and long term, and invite students to seminars. As an undergraduate, I didn't even register those announcements where they have speakers come in each week discussing research. And I think that's one thing professors can do without overwhelming themselves or students. Encourage them to go to at least three or four seminars a semester in any department. Okay. Would anyone else like to respond to that question? I think there, there is also a huge psychological aspect to it as well. If you're an introvert like myself, you actually have to force yourself to network. And um, so <clears throat> there are going to be students who are extroverts uh, that love to talk and love to mingle. And <clears throat> there are opportunities to do that, uh, whether it be at your home institution or you're going to a conference and there's a student mixer. Uh, and, and, and there are opportunities to do that. Um, it, it, when you're an introvert, it's a little bit more difficult. And so I would say to... Uh, educators and professors. You, 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 you know the students who are, who, who are introverts um, and, and that may need just a little bit um, of help uh, or a push to say, you know what, um, let me introduce you to. Um, I, I want to um, talk to you about the work that this student is doing. Um, introductions are always great. Um, I, I, as a personal experience, they've helped me a lot, but I've seen other colleagues and students, and I, and I do this as well because I can understand uh, their point of view. And so for, <clears throat> for educators specifically or uh, students that are a little bit older, like master students, 
than undergrads, uh, introductions are great. It's a great way to start, um, and you know, you never know what will happen as a result of that. Right. Now, one of the things, Dr. Johnson, you talked about in, in the article was that cultural relevant educational programming is a part of making the difference in helping African Americans engage in STEM. So can you provide examples of culturally relevant educational programming? Sure. Um, if you think about textbooks back in the 80s um, and a little before, when you came to, if they talked about a scientist or they talked about a, a scientific discovery, the assumption was that those were being made by people who were not of color. Um, I think that that has been uh, a barrier, and so now there have been efforts made, whether they're physical hard copy textbooks or online, to bring in, to spotlight people of color doing amazing work. Um, and so, you know, you can flip and see profiles, whether they're in middle school or elementary school or high school science, marine science books are there, and you can see different scientists living that look like them. Um, so that's one of those. And when you're also looking at the idea of giving back to your community, um, the idea of science is great and it's a wonderful thing to do, uh, but there are a lot of uh, people of color, first generation, who want to see that they're impacting their community. And so to be able to tie in their skill set, their expertise to make the community better is an important thing. And so there's some um, research there that talks about the types of fields underrepresented minorities pursue um, because of that, that social work, you know, that's being a doctor, that's trying to be even going to law enforcement, those kind of things that we give back because it seems very abstract to see that oceanography or marine science or other majors might have an impact in making our community better. Um, and so one of the things that we need to do as a STEM community is be able to make those connections clearer. Um, so why, how you can help your community and promote the field and advance our workforce is something that we could do a lot on to show that cultural re relevancy and to recruit those students who have been less likely to be engaged in our fields into it. Okay, thank you. Now, one of the things, of course, being an African American in STEM is, you know, having challenges. And Danielle, Dr. Lee, you've had some challenges in 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 your role and in, in being a, an African American in STEM. And I wanted to just talk, you know, about that and how you were able to overcome that and solutions that you would have for anyone that was faced with challenges. Well, so high profile comes with pluses and minuses. So the pluses is that I get to be a role model, I'm accessible, folks know and can associate a face and a personality with actual science research. But one of the downsides, and, and it's important as you matriculate through your career that you balance it, is that by being in a higher profile, it sometimes puts you you know, uh, in the crosshairs, if you will, and it, it, it may mean that your work will be scrutinized more, not necessarily fairly, and what that's where community really, really matters, by having people around you uh, who understand what you're going through, whether because they personally have gone through it or they have an amazing sense of empathy and allyship and they're really ready to surround you with care and concern and actually tool you up like actually helping you get the resources you need to do your science or in my case the science outreach and science communication to stay focused and again it goes back to good networking so being a good scholar is important but it's also about where you go home in the evening or, or who you call home and family, like what Dr. Johnson alludes to, making sure that the science you do is really connected to those people that you care about the most. And having that built around really, really makes a difference. And one of the things that I wanted to definitely ask was, with your challenges, there was an instance where you were called an urban whore and how were you able to to I guess the best way to say is just how were you able to 
surpass that, you know, turn that into something positive and, and providing solutions and, and helping any African American students in STEM who may be experiencing similar challenges in, in trying to express their interests in, in STEM fields. So it really became important as far as just being a voice and particularly at the graduate student level and higher there there are a lot of mixed messages that get communicated about what it takes to participate in science and I think it's very important to remind people that we still have to do everyday things like pay our bills and eat and have a safe place to rest our head and reminding people that we really need to consider our worth as a part of the calculus of engaging us, whether it's engaging us on our science or in our outreach and mentorship, but just reminding scholars, particularly junior scholars, that that needs to be a very conscious part of your calculus. Is this worth it and will they value what I'm bringing to the table? And I got a lot of graduate students, particularly women of color, who reached out to me and continue to reach out with me with questions to help them through tough spots that they're experiencing at their institutions or in their laboratories. Okay. Now, one question that I have for all three of you is in regards to professional organizations, and this actually comes from a member of the audience, and that is, how can professional organizations that are all or predominantly white make the first step towards creating a welcoming environment? for black students and researchers. What are things we can do to reduce the feeling of isolation? So any one of you can, can respond to that question and, ch and chime in. I think we're Sorry. all being polite. <laughs> <laughs> I will um, say, what, what a great question. And um, one where um, I think there, there is opportunity at many of the organizations out there. So, um, you know, one of the first things that that should happen is that awareness, right? So you, you look around you, and you, we had a student ask, you know, what if I'm the only person in the room, right? And so you, you have to have that awareness that there, that there is an issue, you have to be honest about whether or not you care or not, right? And you have to uh, put a process in place uh, to make sure you meet whatever goal you're trying to meet. And in this particular case, uh, for conferences, it would be to, uh, I guess, in this aspect, increase diversity. And so, so where do where do where do organizations start? Um, I sit on the council of the American Geophysical Union. And they've made a, a, a conscious effort, and when I mean conscious, I mean a conscious effort to increase diversity as well as inclusion for their organization, uh, but also uh, increase diversity in terms of where students and early career scientists are in their career, right? So oftentimes we think a lot about uh, ethnicity, and we think a lot about gender. Um, but you also need to have the diversity of the, uh, the majority of the members that you have at your conference. And so if the majority of the members uh, represent students and they also represent early career scientists, and their voices aren't being heard as well, you have to take those into account too. And so, it, you know, ADU has really developed a strategic plan to move forward in the next years to think about how to increase that by development of task force that are targeted and specifically focused on that, but to bring in individuals from different backgrounds in order to talk about really what the issues are, be honest about those, not threatened by them, hear what those individuals have to say, take them in, but then go back and do something with that information uh, that you have. So to me it's about the act of doing. You know, we can talk a lot, but what are you going to do in the process? And so um, those are just some of my recommendations. 
Thank you. Anyone else would like to respond? I just co-sign all of that. It's really the action piece that matters. It's are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you not being defensive? <laughs> and are you willing to put put some elbow grease and some money behind to make those things happen? Okay. Now we have another question from the audience about some fields that are less diverse in STEM. So any specific suggestions for fields that are even less diverse than biology, such as computer, in, um, computer science and engineering, and anything that might be different or special in those cases? I'm not sure if any one of you can speak on that. Or even in ecology, which is an, another question that someone had, you know, there's certain fields that seems to be less diverse. So does anyone know what could be different as to why we don't have a significant amount of African Americans involved in those areas? Well, when I interact with parents, so at a community level, I keep finding that more often than not, parents and adult influencers don't know what's up, up, an opportunity or what's available. And after working with children for so long, I realized that it's really important that we have a multi-generational approach to outreach and engagement. And everyone says we need to keep working with kids at a younger and younger age. That's not bad, but I actually say we need to work with the whole family. We need to let the moms and fathers and grandparents and community leaders know that there's a variety of opportunities out there and let them just create the environment of encouraging students to play around and tinker either outside or engineering or coding computer sciences if if around your dinner table or your family time no one is actually talking about just these things, well that limits what kids have available in their head to kind of just roll through their mental Rolodex. So I really think that's how we start that. We really need to start having these barbershop, beauty shop, after church conversations just about STEM in general, not even about any particular field, but just getting comfortable with those words in our mouth. All right. And, and one of the things, actually, Dr. Cora, I wanted to ask you about was that in the article that you co-wrote with Dr. Johnson, you mentioned that there are successful programs out there that are helping to retain African Americans in science, but changes are needed. Can you give us an idea of those, what changes you're you know, thinking about or recommend based sure. on the article? Absolutely. Uh, but I first want to talk about the good things that are going on first. Okay. So, <clears throat> the for example, the National Science Foundation, and, and, and you've heard uh, Dr. Lee and, and Dr. Johnson talk about the National Science Foundation, its research education undergraduate program, I think has been a uh, sentinel and phenomenal um, uh, process in training, you know, our next scientist, right? So it's all about undergraduate research experience, uh, getting used to the lab, uh, going out in the field, doing research, and oftentimes um, publishing uh, articles. When you talk about NOAA, they, they, they have really great programs such, such as the uh, educational partnership programs that has a variety of scholarships and fellowships uh, that they have uh, supported students every year to do work in marine sciences. Then there's the NOAA graduate science program specifically focused on um, master's students as well as PhDs and training them uh, into transitioning into scientists uh, for federal agencies. But with that being said, there's a tremendous amount of funding uh, geared toward training students and preparing them for the next level. But what then happens is that um, if there are gaps in funding cycles, if uh, programs are, are completely uh, non-funded for uh, the next year or won't come back on the table, all of those training and resources that you put into students to train them to be the next leaders, uh, where does it go? Right, and so <clears throat> some of the issues are really surrounded by one. Fundamentally, it's it, it, 
really is a could be a funding issue. Um, but also, uh, we've got to be able to, as a community of scientists that are out there that know that we need those programs, is to speak up about them because they're vitally important uh, for the monies that we put into training our students to make sure the students have the best experience. But as they go on to the next level and, and become the next leaders and scientists in their field, they're going to need that support as well as early career scientists. So there's oftentimes a gap between uh, you getting the training that you need at, at, at you know, the undergraduate level and then you moving up into your profession and then where does the training uh, go and where does the support go. Everyone needs that as an early career or mid-career uh, scientist. And so those are some of the, I wouldn't say limitations, uh, but those are some of the areas that I believe that um, we as a community uh, in STEM need to definitely focus on because there are gaps in that. Okay. And you also write about incorporating underrepresented minority societal concerns in company training programs and offering professional engagement opportunities. So what would that look like? You know, I'm going to let Dr. Johnson speak to this because she's had quite, a, 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 she's had much more experiences than I have uh, in this particular realm working in the, the, the private sector. But I will say that uh, being a federal scientist, we oftentimes, you know, have to be able to talk to many different stakeholders, right? And so uh, that training and leadership that we need to cross many different sectors, whether it be private, uh, you know, public, or academic uh, will help our next leaders be able to translate the science to inform to inform the public and then to also uh, inform our policy. Okay. So yes, yeah, so Dr. Johnson, so the question about company training programs and offering professional engagement opportunities, like what would that look like? Um, so I think uh, the response you got already was wonderful. Uh, what that can look like in a corporate world um, is being able to be able to engage the, co the community, um, being able to talk about the deliverables. Sometimes when we look at, for instance, gas prices are high. What does that mean? Gas prices are low. What does that mean for the workforce? Um, what are the opportunities associated with that? It's not arbitrary. What's the connection for that? Um, what's the issue, and I'm saying the geoscientists with fracking, what does that mean for us? Um, what is it that we as having the scientific expertise can share with the community so they see where we're trying to go, where they see the impact that our industry is having, as well as where they can be able to engage with the community in a positive way. Um, so I think it opens up for many dialogues, and the dialogues can be well received people of color are sharing those dialogues with those that are in the community of color. Um, not to say that others can't, but there is a connection, there is understanding, there is a shared experience which allows it to be seen as authentic. We begin to speak to that. So having the leadership programs, the opportunity within a corporate environment, not only to use your skill set, but again as we mentioned about that sense of needing to give back to help them understand is something that's vitally important and can be very rewarding for one's career. Now we have a question from um, Isabel Rodriguez who's an undergraduate student studying physics at Portland State and she asks what advice do you have regarding strengthening executive functions so that students can manage themselves and their work? So any one of you can can respond to that question. I I am not afraid to ask for help. I had to learn that, especially during graduate school. And most colleges offer programs such as like Guaranteed 4.0 or any of those programs where they actually tool you up in those executive functions. Take those courses go to those seminars and some of the tricks that really really helped me is the idea of blocking time so like really taking your schedule seriously really identifying your learning uh, styles and your strengths there and then studying according to your strengths finding uh, solutions to those weaknesses whether it's study groups 
or workshops or tutoring, one of the things I had to learn is that tutors are not for remedial learners. Tutors are for everyone. Everyone needs a tutor. Don't be afraid to do a study group or enroll in a workshop and take advantage of those courses. These undergraduate institutions have amazing student services. Take advantage of them. Now, we have another question. Women of color often experience bias for being outspoken and passionate. How can their network help them keep their enthusiasm when they face such challenges? So I'm guilty. That's me. <laughs> I am very outspoken. And it is one of the risks. My community has definitely had my back. And they've, they've kept me grounded. So a community matters, whether it's in person or online they they remind you of your positives and sometimes you need to be reminded of that and because when you are being in the spotlight for being uh, outspoken people are really highlighting negatives and there it is not always a very fair lens so you need some messages that counterbalance these negative images and that can really wear down on you you also need people who love you to give you critical advice. That matters. People who have a vested interest in your success, so much so that they'll tell you the truth to help tool you up. People who don't care about your success will give you advice and criticism, but it's not coming from a place of edification. And that's very important. That's why it matters to keep a really, really good community on board. Great. Anyone else wanted to, to chime in on that question? Okay. We have another question here, and Dr. Johnson, I think this um, is geared towards you. What advice do you have for students that are, are the one and only person in their department and programs? And, you know, what is what can you tell them on how to, you know, find a mentor or reach out to a mentor? Um, so I'll say a couple different ways. Sometimes that mentor might not be on that campus. Um, sometimes you might need to go off campus for that. Um, out of your department across the way, um, I was actually giving a presentation to Women in Science Engineering Conference on two days ago. Um, and I talked about the fact that knowing your landscape is important. Knowing who is for you and who's not for you is important and figuring out where you can get some allies. And so if you have a committee of, at the dissertation level of a group of expertise that's phenomenal, there might be some challenges figuring out who can be that outside member who can serve on your community, has a voice that will be listened to and highly regarded. Um, in my instance at Texas A&M, I had Karen Watson, who was an associate dean of engineering. I was in College of Geosciences. I was an oceanographer. Karen Watson was very well respected, understood the struggle, um, although she was not a person of color, and now is provost of Texas A&M. Um, I had my dean of graduate studies on that committee, as of geosciences on that committee, because I knew that it was going to be a little challenging at times, and I need to be able to have some strategic champions that would, could speak not only while I'm there to me, but when I was outside on the other side of the door. And so for the grad level, it's very important that you pick who's on those committees strategically. And, you know, one of the things that I'm smiling about, because there have been a couple instances within our MSPhDs community that there have been mentors from the MSPhDs program who have worked in government or other institutions who've been asked to serve on committees at various institutions for that very reason, not only because of the expertise they bring, because they need a champion. So it's important to understand that you'll have advisors in your life. It's important to understand that you'll have mentors and some will speak into you for a moment and some will walk your life with you. Um, and that's a composite mentor. You need different people speaking into you at different times. And then it's really important to try to identify those champions. And again, um, I with Dr. Lee saying, and you need to have people who love you and tell you the truth. Um, because if they care enough to tell you the truth, 
they're in it for your good and they want to see you succeed. So I used to say I collect mentors. And one of my mentors, Marilyn Souter at NSF, told me it's not that you collect them, you have a composite mentor. And so I have really glommed on to that term. And so you can never have too many parts that make up what you need. And you turn to them strategic points in your career to have them speak a word into you at that, mo at that moment that you need it. Great. Now, we only have about four minutes left, and I think the, the, the work that you all are doing is absolutely phenomenal, and I do want to thank those that have submitted questions, and, you know, we weren't able to get to all of them, but this will not be the only time that these conversations, you know, take place. So, you know, keep that in mind. As you see, each of the panelists, including myself, we have our Twitter handles, so please tweet us. And, and if you also have other ideas and initiatives, please um, do, you know, share that with us as well. Um, what I wanted to do at this time was ask each of our panelists you know, if they have any final words that they would like to share. Yes. Okay. So, on the topic of increasing diversity in, in marine sciences, I think that we have a lot of issues in our communities today uh, that require us to, to, to reach out and communicate our science a little bit better. There are quite a few environmental justice issues. Uh, they may be uh, fields, uh, they may be uh, coastal degradation, they may be impacts to our public water supply, uh, but, but all of these issues are in our communities and they're not separate one another. They don't discriminate. And so it's really important if we're trying to increase diversity, in particular in the marine sciences, is to, to go out in the communities because your work, the work that you do is highly relevant. Uh, it, it can be locked up in, 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 in books, um, but there are folks on the ground that need your expertise, need your information, um, and, and they want to know how to make their communities better. And that's one of the ways we can begin to, to increase diversity in the marine sciences, is to make it relevant to the communities that you live in and work in, not not just the lab benches and not just our beautiful, you know, experimental forest that we work in. All right. Uh, to piggyback off of that, I really want to encourage students at any level, so whether they're still K-12 students with their families or even undergraduates, in my field in ecology and animal behavior, I want you to recognize that there are so many opportunities to do what I call backyard biology. You don't need fancy equipment. Like Dr. Okoro said, you don't need to go to these faraway places. There are relevant and important things to notice. And, and I start there because observation is the foundation of the scientific method. Just your ability to pay attention and catalog the, that information is happening in your community, temperature changes, what animals are there and when, that's important science you can do already. Citizen science has an amazing opportunity and is ushering a new time to engage community scientists. I really want to encourage communities of color and inner city communities to really start there. You don't need any fancy equipment and you can start right there and it could lead to so many things from college scholarships to college opportunities to even an entire career studying these things. So start where you are. You don't need to do anything extra fancy just to get started. Yes. Any um, final words, Dr. Johnson? Um, I'm just really delighted that we had this dialogue. Um, I've been involved in several dialogues and discussions about underrepresented minorities in STEM, what should be done. We've covered a little ground in a very short period of time. Um, I hope that the dialogue continues, whether it, whatever the platform will be, um, because it's needed. And after the dialogue, the actions, the recommendations that were made here are right on point and right on target. And so I would reach out and challenge the, the professional society communities, the professors, the universities, the people who can help the next generation of STEM become more diverse to take note of what's been said, take it to heart, and see how they can push the needle. 
Thank you all so much, um, ladies, Dr. Shanti Johnson, Dr. Melanie Harrison Okoro, and Dr. Danielle Lee for your insight. We thank you all for watching, and Danielle Lee, Dr. Lee can be found online. And with, if you want to mention your blog, so I'm the Urban Scientist, and you can find me at the Scientific American Network and the Urban Scientist. You'll see me, D and Lee Five. Fantastic. And Dr. Johnson and Dr. Okora's article, How to Recruit and Retain Underrepresented Minorities, can be found in the latest issue of American Scientists, which is at americanscientist.org and at your local newsstands. This is Janelle Simmons. Thank you to our panelists, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Stay tuned. And yes, you can see this again. It will be archived on our Google page for this event. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, ladies. You're welcome. Bye-bye.